Uh, good evening, MA 3210 Thermo 1 class. I'm going to record some lecture here. And I think Wes will finish the uh, slides and we may talk about another topic or two and then we shall work example problems for the rest of the time that we have. So uh, thermoelectric cooling uh, is a topic that is covered in the textbook. Uh, the, they didn't have any slides on it, so I have added these slides. And I must tell you, I do not claim to have a very uh, solid understanding of exactly how these things work. So I have taken the material uh, in the textbook and made slides out of it, and we will review that. Because, I mean, this, these systems are out there. They've been out there for a while. And you need to just have some, at least, cursory knowledge of them. So thermoelectric coolers are already in use for spaceflight cooling, uh, power amplifier cooling, microprocessor cooling. Well, certain specialized kind of niche applications is where these things are currently used. Uh, thermoelectric cooler operate, operates between a cold region, TC, and a hot region, TH. And so we're going to transfer heat from the cold region, as you know, any refrigeration device does, and uh, deposit it in the warmer region at TH, the higher temperature. The cooler is formed from two N-type and two P-type semiconductors uh, with low thermal conductivity, uh, five metallic interconnects with high thermal conductivity and two electrically insulating ceramic substrates and a power source. So uh, this is really uh, this, these uh, this semiconductor materials and the physics of this is in the, the bailiwick of the uh, electrical engineer, uh, physical electronics and all that stuff studies this up and down uh, and in great detail. So this is, I guess, kind of where uh, electrical engineering bleeds over a little bit into mechanical engineering. Okay, so we're gonna try to talk about how this thing operates. So when power is supplied, current flows through the circuit, giving a cooling effect, i.e. a heat transfer from the cold region. And you know, we know by the second law that you can't pull heat out of something cold and deposit it in something hot without some sort of a system or, or uh, to, to make that happen. It's not gonna happen naturally. <clears throat> this is known as the Peltier uh, effect. The P-type semiconductor material in the right leg has electron vacancies called holes. So when they start doping up all this semiconductor stuff, they can make them places in the uh, matrix of the material where electrons should be present, they can somehow manufacture this with those electrons absent. And then that site is called a hole instead of having an electron. So a hole is a positive uh, charge and an electron is a negative charge. And these holes can move uh, through the substrate. <clears throat> and I'm not sure I totally understand this just like electrons can flow through the substrate. But the P-type semiconductor material in the right leg over here, so we've got um, a right leg, uh, P-type here and a P-type here and an N-type here and an N-type here. Let me get my arrow set. Um, so the P-type material has electron vacancies called holes. Electrons move through this material by filling holes, and that process slows electron motion. And that's a key aspect of making this device work. Uh, in the adjacent n-type material, no holes exist in its material structure. So electrons move freely and more rapidly through the material. So we don't have holes in the n-type stuff. So the electrons just fly through this stuff and the presence of holes slow them down in the p-type material. When power supplied, positively charged holes move in the direction of the current, while negatively charged electrons move opposite to the current. Each transfers energy from the cold region to the warm region. The process of Peltier refrigeration may be understood by following the journey of an electron as it travels from the negative 
terminal of the power source to the positive terminal. So we're going to be uh, following some electrons, <laughs> I guess. Okay. I'm flowing through the metallic interconnect into the p-type material. So here is the uh, interconnect. And so I guess we're flowing in in this direction. Um, okay, flowing through the metallic interconnect into the p-type material. The electron slows and loses energy, causing the surrounding uh, material to warm. Yeah, and the electron's coming in here. And when it flows in, here, it's going in this direction. The interaction with the holes causes this material to heat up on this end. Well, it heats up hot enough that it's hotter than this warm region. And so heat flows from this end of the p-type semiconductor into the warm region because of the interaction of the electrons with these holes. At the other end of the p-type material, the electron accelerates as it enters the metallic interconnect and then the n-type material. So the electrons being retarded, going slow through here, it hits this interconnect, uh, which is right here. And I, I guess we should have looked at all this, uh, the general geometry. We've got our warm region at TH, our cold region at TC, uh, P-type, N-type, P-type, N-type. Here's the metallic interconnects that direct the current flow. And then here's the ceramic uh, substrate, an insulating ceramic substrate on either end. So the heat can transfer through this, but the electrons and holes don't flow through it. Okay, so as the electron exits the p-type material into the interconnect, it accelerates and goes really, really fast, and then goes through the n-type material really, really fast. Well, that causes a cooling effect down here which makes this end cold and it sucks heat out of this cold region at TC because this temperature is lower than the cold region TC. Okay, the accelerating electron acquires energy from the surrounding material and causes the end of the p-type leg to cool. So that makes it cold down here. When the electron traverses the p-type material from the hot end to the cold end, holes are moving from the cold end to the hot end, transferring energy away from the cold end. So the, uh, the flow of holes also pulls energy away from this uh, cold region and helps to move it to the warm region. While traversing the n-type material from the cold end to the hot end, an electron also transfers energy away from the cold end to the hot end. So the electron speeding up and flowing through this at high speed also produces a cooling effect in this region that pulls more heat uh, out of the cold region and transfers it to the warm region. This scenario repeats itself at each pair of p-type n-type legs, resulting in more removal of energy from the cold end and its deposit at the hot end. So, this particular thermoelectric cooler shows two pairs. We got a P and an N, and then we got another P and another N, and you can have a whole bunch of these things lined up to increase the amount of heat that's transferred from the cold region to the warm region. Thus, the overall effect is to transfer heat from the cold region to the warm region. I think I've said that. Uh, these simple coolers have no moving parts and are compact. They are reliable and quiet and they use no refrigerants. Thermoelectric coolers have only specialized application because of their low coefficients of performance compared to vapor compression systems. So for any large scale application, they're just not efficient enough currently to be used, to be considered. New materials and production methods may improve this in the future. A lot of research goes on, national labs and different universities, uh, continue to look into this. At the core of the thermoelectric cooler are two dissimilar materials, n-type and p-type semiconductors. To be effective, the materials must have uh, low thermal conductivity and high electrical conductivity, a rare combination in nature. So that's one of the issues that there just aren't a lot of materials that 
have this combination of uh, properties that we need to make this thing work better and better. New materials and novel microscopic, with novel microscopic properties at the nanometer level may lead to improve uh, thermoelectric cooler performance. So we'll see what happens in the future. Okay, so that's the end of that little topic. And I've got one more here that I've got two slides on. And then we'll talk some more about this. Uh, th th this relates to the electric rate um, file that I sent you. I think I sent you one from Nashville. Um, so this is cold storage. So chilling water or making ice during off-peak electric billing periods, usually overnight and over weekends, and storing chilled water or ice in tanks until it's needed for space cooling is known as cold storage. Applications of cold storage include cooling of office buildings, medical centers, college campus buildings, and shopping malls, and you know any fairly large scale operation that needs consistent air conditioning. Uh, this could be a candidate for. Cold storage does not save energy. In fact, it requires more energy, but it can reduce operating cost by using electricity when it is cheap, as opposed to higher charges during on-peak hours. So what makes this go is the time of day metering and electric rates that some utilities have uh, implemented in recent years. And so that's why you'll, we'll go over a little bit on the rate structures, but there are certain periods of the day where electricity is way more expensive than it is the rest of the time. And so during the cheap periods, if you can run your big water chillers or, you know, and make either just store cold water or you could store ice and then melt the ice to make your chill water that actually goes through coils that provides air conditioning to make it cold. You can leave the big refrigeration machines, the chillers off during the on-peak period and save significantly on your electric bill. So that's what this is looking at. And so what you see here, um, we've got some sort of a refrigeration system. And this is a little bit of a cartoon, but this is what's producing the cold temperatures. And so uh, we got really cold refrigerant. It goes either over here and it either can freeze. They make specialized tanks that you can flow this through and it freezes ice in a, a very organized pattern. Um, or you can just, like I said, store cold water. You know, if you've got a bunch of say 38, 40 degree water, that big insulated tank, it's a lot of refrigeration stored in there. Uh, and then when you need the cooling, uh, this would be the air handling unit. So you've got warm, humid air, return air coming back from the spaces. You've got a coil in here. And so we simply pump um, a liquid, probably water, or it could be, you know, a glycol solution to make sure it doesn't freeze, whatever. Um, and it goes through a coil over here and it, it, it gets cooled down. And then we just pump it through this cooling coil and that provides the air conditioning. So, I mean, schematically, it's uh, pretty simple to look at. Uh, the system consists of a vapor compression, compression unit, ice maker and uh, ice storage tank and coolant loop, or like I said, it can just be chill water. Running at night when power is cheaper uh, and a little less power is needed uh, because of lower ambient temperatures the unit freezes water. So that it is true that uh, when you get uh, lower temperatures in the ambient, these things work a little bit more efficiently. But the other thing that hurts the energy efficiency is you have a pump down here, an extra pump that you have to run. Uh, and you have heat losses. These are usually large tanks. And um, even if they're well insulated, you have some heat loss. And so generally speaking, um, you have to run a little bit more refrigeration um, power to make this go, even though the author doesn't maybe agree with me, but I, I've got a little bit of experience with these things. So anyway, we produce ice and it's stored in a tank when cooling is needed during the daytime, the on-peak billing period more specifically. Cold water is pumped through cooling coils to produce cold air, which it provides the air conditioning. 
uh, the melting ice provides required building cooling. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good idea. I mean, there are some of these things in operation. They're fairly expensive. And uh, the difference between on-peak and off-peak rates has to be significant uh, in order to make them go. Okay, so that's the end of that. So I'm gonna pause this for a minute and pull up the rate file and then we'll get. Okay, class, uh, this is the uh, rate structure that I sent you. And this went into effect August, 2020. So it is uh, uh, what is currently uh, in force. Uh, it's a GSA is a general service agreement and the T stands for time of day GSA. So uh, these utilities have lots of different rates. And uh, it, when you establish service, you can uh, try to negotiate which rate you think is gonna be best for you. And then you sign a contract and then they bill you under that rate. Um, I would encourage you to read this. There's a lot of information here. I can't read it all to you on this, but basically uh, GSA, there's GSA 1, GSA 2, GSA 3. And as the customer gets larger, the amount of the, the, the load, the electrical load that they put on the system, uh, larger customers go to two and then larger than that go to three. And then big manufacturing facilities have manufacturer's rates for them. So I'm gonna talk through the GSA 3. Uh, so say here's GSA 1, that's what this refers to. And this is uh, basically 12, uh, 50 kW and less. So 50 kW is a good size house, you know? So this, and then the GSA, this would be for a commercial type business. Uh, but 50 kW is not very large. I mean, a big house, five, 10,000 square feet is probably gonna have a demand of you know, pushing 30 to 50 kW. Uh, and then here's GSA 2, uh, greater than uh, 50, but less than 1,000 kW. And 1,000 kW uh, is, is, you know, a small, medium-sized plant, uh, uh, a small office building, something like that would probably be uh, in this range. Um, and you can see it, the structures are pretty similar. The numbers change. Uh, as we go up. So here's GSA 3. So these are bigger guys and you know, they might be more fun to talk about. So basically, if your uh, contract demand is expected to be greater than a thousand and you're uh, kind of a general uh, commercial uh, business, you might well be on this rate. So we start off, we've got just a service charge. So you get to pay them $934.50 per meter. So if you had if you had two meters, you have to pay this twice. If you have just one meter coming into the building, you, you get to pay it once. And that's for the privilege of doing business with the utility. They have some just, you know, they have fixed overhead costs and they have their own costs anyway. Uh, they, you have to pay that. And then TVA in the last number of years has instituted this grid access charge. And so it is uh, $205.30 per month if the customer's average monthly KWH, and that's electrical energy, kilowatt hours, usage during the latest 12 month period is not more than 150,000 kilowatt hours. Uh, so if you use enough, they're gonna waive this. Oh, well, it's gonna be, uh, if, if you're smaller, I guess it's gonna be this. Or, if it's greater than 150,000, this, this would be your average monthly electrical energy use during the past 12 months. Greater than that, you're gonna to get to pay them a grid access charge of $579.04 a month. Those are flat fees. So, you know, they got all your bills in the computer and they run this average and bingo, you get charged either this or this on top of this. But that's just kind of fixed cost. Okay, demand. So in an electric bill, there are what they call energy charges, which you see down here at the bottom, and demand. Well, the demand is basically based on the highest rate at which you use electrical energy during the month. Okay, so that's KW, because KW is rate, right? What is that, a kilojoule per second? But a kilowatt hour is energy. So that's using one KW for one hour is one kilowatt hour. And that's an amount. And so the KW is a rate. 
So we see we have different charges based on the summer, okay, uh, winter and transition period. And let's see. Uh, and this, this is a seasonal, but this is not on peak and off peak. I'll be darned. Well, we'll talk through this one quickly, and then I'll have to pull up another one that has, I thought this had, when I pulled it up, I thought it had the time of day, but this one doesn't look like it has time of day on it. We'll see as we go through. Um, anyway, so for demand charge in the summer, uh, your first, thousand kW billing demand is nineteen dollars and eighty cents per kW and then anything over that it goes up a little bit to 1993 per kW plus um, an additional 1993 per kW per month for each kW if any of the amount by which the customers uh, billing contract, billing demand exceeds uh, its contract demand. So you have a contract demand you're not supposed to go over. So that this doesn't kick in very often uh, unless something strange happens. So we have the same structure in the winter, but notice the charges go down a little bit. So the first thousand uh, KW billing demand, there's 1884 and anything over a thousand is 1897. We get a little bit of a break. And then the transition months. So this would be, um, uh, let's see, October, November, and April and May are the transition months, the spring and the fall. Uh, but it's the same numbers as the winter period. So we go up a little bit, okay? And then we see the energy charge. This is uh, cents per kilowatt hour. So in the summer period, oh no, it is uh, on peak and off peak, I'm sorry. I just didn't uh, show anything in the uh, demand charges. Okay, so for the summer period uh, on peak, and we'll have to read down below the definitions of on peak and off peak, but we see in the summer period, it's 6.521 cents per kilowatt hour uh, on peak electrical energy uh, plus 5.195 cents per kilowatt hour for all off peak. So it's a little bit more expensive in the summer. Um, and so these, th there's not a tremendous penalty in this rate structure. Sometimes it's more than this. Uh, and then the winter period, we have on peak uh, electrical energy at 6.1 and off peak at 5.496 cents per kilowatt hour off peak. And then in the transition months, it's all uh, 5.616. Okay, on peak and off peak hours. Well, here's your seasonal periods. Uh, summer period shall be uh, June, July, August, and September. Winter is December, January, February, March, and then the transition periods are April, May, October, and November. And then the uh, on peak and off peak hours. And you can read through all this. I mean, it's not holidays, it's not weekends, <clears throat> etc. And it calls out, but for the basic working days, on peak uh, hours for each day, the purpose of this rate structure, uh, it's 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. during the cooling season, which they figure is April, May, June, July, August, September, and October. And then in the heating season, the rest of the months, it's 4 a.m. to 10 a.m. And that's when the electrical system sees their peak demands. And so they're going to make it more expensive in hopes that you will transfer, reduce energy use during the on-peak to save a little bit of money. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, you can read through the rest of this. If you have any questions, uh, you can let me know. There's a lot of details here, but uh, we cover this in other courses, but I just wanted to show you. So on this uh, cold storage, um, if you could save enough money by running your big uh, Cheller's refrigeration machines on the 
off peak hours and then turn them off on the on peak hours, you could reduce that demand and that energy consumption and you can save some money. So that's kind of what this is all about. Okay, I'm gonna stop this one and uh, then I will post some more later on working through some homework problems. So hope you guys have a great evening and I'll be back in touch soon.